this week's drive, we become a high-speed passenger in a costly crash, stand up for the applause of the crowd, prepare for a tarmac rally battle, and see more than this record breaker. All this and more in this week's Drive. For McLaren Mercedes Formula One drivers Kimi Raikkonen, David Coulthard and test driver Alexander Wurz, a season isn't only about racing and relentless testing. The star athletes must make countless press, media and public relations appearances. David and Kimi attended the traditional Mercedes-Benz party in Montreal, Canada. Uh, Austrian Alexander was at the 100th anniversary of the famous Solitude races near Stuttgart, where he drove one of just six twin-turbo smart roadster prototypes, as we saw on drive a few weeks ago. At the Legends of Grand Prix party, DC was among friends to commemorate the final Grand Prix on the A1 ring in Austria. Also in Austria, Kimi played a round of golf at a charity day in aid of the Brain and Spine Foundation, headed by Formula One's medical expert, Professor Sid Watkins. Earlier, Kimi had put on a display with his McLaren racer for crowds of fans to celebrate 100 years of the Adak German Car Club. The two drivers were also required to be present at a garden party for sponsors Mobile at a castle near Silverstone, as well as a press dinner with motoring journalists ahead of the European Grand Prix at the Nürburgring. Scotsman David was the team's representative of the Goodwood Festival of Speed in the UK, where he drove the 1955 streamlined W196 up the hill climb course. Kimi, from Finland, raced carts and played ice hockey for sponsors West in Bratislava in the Slovak Republic. Before the German race, they visited the smart factory and spoke to production line workers. I bought two of your vehicles over the years. In between the public appearances are many private interviews and photo shoots, sponsors' appearances and countless requests for attendances at charity and fundraising functions. Also, drivers must maintain a strict physical fitness regime, which usually occupies a couple of hours every morning and evening, and which is often made more difficult when they're away from home. Then I can watch your DVD, and the driver can see the navigation. Later, they visited the Center of Excellence, where Maybach limousine customers can choose the specification of their very personal vehicles. Thank you very much. And the team launched the new SLR McLaren at the Frankfurt Motor Show. We'll see more of this car in a future episode of Drive. Thank you. Talladega, one of NASCAR's true super speedways and reputed to be the fastest racetrack in the world, played host to the EA Sports 500 race. It got off to a clean start on the 2.6-mile banked oval in front of 100,000 fans. On lap 182, just six laps from the finish, there was a frightening crash as pole sitter Elliot Sadler was hit and became airborne. Later, Sadler said that in the car, it just got really quiet and he was looking at the dirt and the asphalt. For him, the whole first pirouette was just so much slow motion the whole time. Then, when he started hitting, everything sped up. He was never unconscious and remembers every bump, every bruise. This is the second time he's flipped, and both times he ended up back on all four wheels. And then when it gets onto the racetrack again, takes another... Did he close his eyes? Yes, he closed them, peaked, and then closed them again. He was sure he was headed to the inside wall, so he braced himself for that. And then all of a sudden everything went quiet again, and he was flying through the air once more. Sadler left on a stretcher and was flown to hospital in Birmingham, Alabama. He sustained no serious injuries and was later released. After the Sadler crash, the race was red flagged to clear the track, and after two laps were run under a caution period, there were four laps left to the finish. But you see the hood flopping around in the deck lid, the tethers. Michael Waltrip won that sprint to the checkered flag as he outraced teammate Dale Earnhardt Jr. Series points leader Matt Kenseth was credited with 33rd place despite failing to finish because of an engine problem. Kenseth leads the standings by 354 points from Kevin Harvick, who was seventh at Talladega. 
Earnhardt Jr. is third. Remarkably, a crash after the chequered flag caused expensive damage for Bobby Labonte, Kenny Wallace and Mark Martin. Waltrip won by 0.095 of a second from his teammate. So, you know, we've stepped up. Alex on the back row. Of the 19 drivers who started Kart's Grand Prix Americas in Miami, eight live in the area, but none of them fared too well on their home track. Moments after a restart, Oriol Sevilla crashed into the wall. Paul Tracy did well to avoid being taken out in the incident. The fearsomely bumpy section can clearly be seen. And this is no place to drive a race car at any speed. It's a miracle that no one suffered suspension failure. On lap 91, Michel Jourdain was leaving his pit and trying to avoid tyres set out by the crew in the pit just ahead of him. As he went round them, he was hit by Diego Montero. Montero was trying to get into his pit stall. Just two laps later, an accident involved race leader Adrian Fernandez, second place Bruno Jonquera, and the luckless Montero. Junquera locked up the brakes to avoid Fernandez, but spun and hit Montero. An upset Fernandez was hoping for a push so that he could refire the engine and get back into the race. What happened there? It was not to be for Fernandez, and Mexico's Mario Dominguez went on to take the checkered flag for his second kart victory, ahead of teammate Roberto Moreno. Finland's Mika Salo, another ex-Formula One driver, was third. Paul Tracy crashed with Sebastian Bourdais and retired without scoring. He leads the championship with 204 to the 191 points of Junquera. Three races remain in the series, and the next round is in Mexico City. Gracias, viva Mexico! Italy's Max Biaggi powered his Honda to pole position for the MotoGP Pacific Grand Prix at Motegi in Japan. Biaggi, fourth fastest in Friday's qualifying, set the quickest lap at the 4.8 kilometer circuit, setting a pole position record. The previous record was held by the late Daijiro Kato of Japan, who died in a high speed crash at the season opening race at Suzuka, now dropped from the championship. Japan's Makoto Tomada, who claimed his first podium finish at the Rio Grand Prix two weeks ago with a third place finish, was second fastest, also on a Honda. World champion Valentino Rossi, who leads the overall standings with 262 points, 51 ahead of Spain's Sete Gibinau, was third. If Rossi won the race and Gibinau failed to finish, the 24-year-old Italian stood to become world champion for the third year in a row. Gibinau, who had the fastest time on Friday, led for most of Saturday's qualifying, but was overtaken near the end of the one-hour session and went to fourth. Gibinau's best finish at Motegi was a fifth place in 1999, and Cato was his teammate. Spain's Tony Elias sealed his third successive pole position in the 250 class on his Aprilia, ahead of Franco Batoni of Italy and Frenchman Randy Depunier. Overall points leader Manuel Poggiali of San Marino took seventh on the second row of the grid. In the 125s, title leader Daniel Pedrosa of Spain took pole ahead of rival Stefano Perugini. Jorge Lorenzo, winner in Rio, took his third front row start of the season in third place, with Hector Barbera making it three Spaniards in the top four. On the first corner, Biagi lost the lead to Gibinau, the only man capable of denying Valentino Rossi the world championship. John Hopkins missed his brake marker and skittled Carlos Checa, Troy Bayliss and Colin Edwards, who all slid off into the gravel. Meanwhile, Biaggi seized the lead back, in the process doing Rossi a favor, although it's unlikely that that was his motive. As Biaggi began to open up a comfortable gap out in front, the real drama became the battle for second place, with Rossi, Chibanao, American Nicky Hayden and Japan's Makoto Tamada all jostling for position. Rossi edged up to second and began to chase Biaggi before a huge mistake saw the series leader run off into the gravel, returning in ninth place over eight seconds down. As Biaggi built a comfortable lead, positions chopped and changed in a battle for the podium, and Rossi picked his way through the field with a string of scorching laps. Rossi was back in touch with seven laps remaining. However, Biaggi maintained a strong rhythm at the front to seal his second victory of the season.
On the final lap, Tomada made contact with Gibinau, forcing the Spaniard into the gravel. He recovered to finish fifth. Tomada was later disqualified for the move, promoting Sete to fourth. Biagi eventually crossed the finishing line 3.7 seconds ahead of Rossi. Hopkins was sanctioned for his first lap mistake with a one-race ban, meaning that he will miss the next round at Sepang in Malaysia. It was a good race, a good start. Uh, at the beginning of the race, uh, Chibernaus was try hard, and then uh, I follow him. I saw I have some some better line, and I can break, I can um, overtake him on breaks. So I was a little bit faster, and then I go with my rhythm. And the pace was 49, all 49.6. So it was good rhythm for all the race. I couldn't go much faster, but it was enough to go and make a break with the other guy. After his second place finish, Rossi leads the overall point standings with 282 points, 60 more than Gibernau. He can wrap up his third title with a podium finish in Malaysia. In the 250 race, Tony Elias of Spain held off a late challenge from Italy's Roberto Rolfo to take victory from pole. Overall points leader Manuel Poggiali of San Marino was third. 250cc rookie Poggiali, the reigning 125 champion, has taken podiums in the last four races and is on course for a fairy tale year. In the 125cc race, Spain's Hector Barbera came from behind to win over 21 laps. Australia's Casey Stoner was second, 0.164 of a second back, while Italy's Andrea Dovizioso was third. Overall leader Daniel Pedrosa of Spain finished sixth. Pedrosa's looking good for his maiden world title, although the quest for second is still a three-way battle with three rounds to go. The 57th Motocross of Nations was held at Zolda in Belgium in front of a crowd of 23,000 around the purpose-built course that crosses the historic motor racing circuit several times. A taster of what was to come was provided by the first semi-final in which AMA champion Ricky Carmichael of the USA and Stefan Everts indulged in a battle for the lead throughout the first half of the race, watched by the Belgian King. Intermittent rain and winter sunshine changed conditions throughout the meeting. Sword of Great Britain and Tyler Rattray of South Africa crashed on the Savage Whoops. In the final, Everts let the American get away and chose to defend a solid second position. He was content in the knowledge that his teammate and fellow world champion Joel Smets was in a solid third place, having crashed in the semi-final. Andy Lyons of Ireland fell foul of the rain-altered whoops. Team USA's chances of victory faltered when Tim Ferry crashed out while eighth and eventually crossed the line ninth. American Ryan Hughes also crashed and couldn't restart due to a broken chain. Belgian 125 world champ Steve Ramon was another faller on his new KTM 250, but didn't affect the outcome. Victory for Belgium. Winning in front of the king uh, is something really uh, special. It's the first time, you know, he's here, and uh, I'm so proud, you know, to win. And also, uh, I'm happy for Steve and Joel. Um, yeah, it's been a, a tough race. Um, Ricky rode strong, and I think we had uh, the best team, and uh, yeah, we won. Uh, the motocross and Asians, and that's the most important thing, so I'm, I'm really happy. The 2003 World Championship winning trio of Stefan Evertz, Joel Smets and Steve Ramon notched the highest results and therefore the lowest winning score of five to win the event. The USA came second and Finland third for the second year in succession. It's the 13th time the Belgians have claimed the trophy of the prestigious end-of-season competition. In another end-of-season contest for national teams, a crowd of over 3,000 spectators turned out for the 20th running of the Trial de Nations. The host nation Italy, whose team consisted of Lenzi, Orizio, Gandini and Bosses, incurred 42 penalty points and finished just outside a podium place in fourth position. Here, Diego Bosses recovers from a near disaster, picking up just one point rather than five for a complete crash. The Japanese team struck problems when Taichi Tanaka's bike didn't run well and the gas gas rider conceded five penalties at the last three sections, although Japan maintained third place in the standings to the end of the trial. His three colleagues, Takahisa Fujinami, Kenichi Kurayama and Fumitaka Nozaki, put their team into third place with 24 penalty points. 
The battle for the trial to nation title lay between the reigning champions Great Britain and Spain, runners-up last year. The Spanish foursome of Mark Frisia, Adam Raga, Mark Colomer and Albert Cabastani were penalised by the observer in Section 2 following a mistake by Cabastani. Then Didac Circos, Frisia's minder, went into the section and altered the terrain to give confidence to his rider. The observer saw the action as a foul and added five points to the penalty card of the Spaniards. Spain appealed against the observer's decision, but the appeal was thrown out. Britain started without Steve Colley, unable to attend the competition due to stomach problems. Ben Hemingway, the substitute rider, joined Lampkin, Jarvis and Connor on the British team. On the second loop of the competition, Spain picked up their game, finishing the circuit with only three points. But this was not enough to overtake Britain, who claimed the win, their fourth crown in the trial to nation, by only one point. The circuit had a very low level of difficulty throughout its 18 rocky sections, with soft and often slippery terrain. The victory was Great Britain's fourth in the trial to nation. They won the event in 1997, 99 and 2002. In addition to the narrow win by Britain, Germany beat Sweden to seventh place by a single point, while Norway finished on 291 penalties, over 100 behind their Scandinavian neighbours. Fans came from all over the world for the finale of the nine-round series that would decide the 2003 world champion. Just one point separated Australian Jason Crump from Denmark's Nicky Pedersen, and neither had previously won the title. Both knew that the reigning and five times world champ Tony Rickardson was waiting to punish any mistake that the new challengers to his crown may make. Nicky Pedersen's challenge looked like it was all over with a bad crash early in the evening, but with only pulled ligaments in his ankle, he went on to come second in the first semi-final eliminator, behind his namesake Bjarne, for a place in the final. They beat American Scott Nichols and Poland's Thomas Golob. Things promptly swung the other way in an evening of high drama. The championship was effectively sealed in the second eliminator when the leader of the series, Jason Crump, who has won two Grand Prix this season, was deemed to have taken out Rune Halter of Denmark and was excluded. That handed the overall points victory to Nicky Pedersen and the delight in the garage was immediate. With Andreas Johansson excluded, the three-man final was won by the USA's Greg Hancock from the two Pedersons, Nicky and Bjarne. Almost lost in the euphoria of Pedersons World Championship success was Hancock's win. Remarkably, Hancock also won the final round of the 2002 championship in Sydney last year. But the night belonged to Nicky Pedersen, the fifth rider from Denmark to win the Speedway World Championship. Crump, world number two for the past three seasons, was devastated but bravely faced the TV cameras and the media. Third in the championship was outgoing champ Tony Rickardson, who warned Pedersen and Crump that he was still ready, willing and able to take back his crown next year. Being the best doesn't come easily, and for the Peugeot Rally team that means putting in long days and nights of hard work as the World Rally Championship reaches its climax. Marcus Gronholm is the reigning world champion. With three events to go, the Finn trails by 19 points and needs strong performances if he is to stand any chance of holding onto his crown. 2003 has been a vintage year for motorsport fans. The Formula One World Championship produced a great three-way dogfight for much of the year, and the World Rally Championship is building towards a thrilling climax too. Peugeot leads the race for the driver's title and trails Citroën in the manufacturer's title, but it's tight. Ronholm's teammate Richard Burns leads the driver's title by two points without winning a round this year, but his nearest rival, Sebastian Loeb, is a tarmac specialist, and he won in San Remo. Now the team is perfecting their cars for the new conditions. We, we look to make the car really easy to drive and, and uh, not oversteering, not understeering. You know, for me, it would be the best if it's neutral. neutral. 
and uh, easy to drive. Then the times will come. Co-drivers need to know the roads as well as the drivers and condense exhaustive notes into precise instructions. We, we may have rain and we may have leaves on the road and, and dirty roads. So we really have to concentrate now after a long break on Tarma. Ronholm started the season with three wins in the first five events, but has since scored a second and five pointless results in DNFs. With Burns fretful and ill at ease on the asphalt, Peugeot will no doubt be looking to the contribution of Gilles Panizzi, the team's tarmac specialist. The Frenchman has won in Italy for the last four years and came second this year. But in the past 20 years, only four non-French drivers has managed to win in Corsica. Uh, sure, we have some pressure for the moment, but it's uh, really interesting. So uh, we fight a lot for the end of the season. Um, uh, the main goal is the two championships, so we work on it. We will see. Training for Corsica isn't easy. The island's asphalt roads take a special type of courage when sheer cliffs drop suddenly away inches from the roadside. Corsica is tough on both car and driver. The roads are made of extremely abrasive tar that puts the tyres under great stress. High cornering speeds and the twisty roads mean G-forces are higher than anywhere else on the calendar, making this event just as physically demanding on the drivers as traditional endurance events such as the safari or Greece. And finally, we join three mates as they set off for a ride together. Two following the leader as they accelerate hard on a deserted runway. But this is no casual ride. This is the setting of a new land speed record by bike mad ex soldier Billy the Wiz Baxter. Billy is 39. He's also blind. After a tour of duty in Bosnia in 1997, Billy contracted a rare eye disease, and after 20 years in the army, he lost his sight and his job. But he found St Dunstan's, the charity that provides lifelong care and support for blind ex-servicemen and women. That's 170 miles an hour. With radio instructions from his outriders, members of his regimental display team, the Flying Gunners, Billy took the record from Ken Moss, who set the previous mark in a car. The team cut down on the information a lot during practice. Billy didn't need to know the speed, he's just going flat out, and accelerating as hard as possible cuts out the wobbles but at anything below 60, they have to count him down so that when he puts his feet down, the floors stop moving. Billy, fantastic achievement. What do you feel about it? Um, well, I feel absolutely over the moon. It's still not sunk in yet. Um, it's a combination of a year's graft. Um, of, of finding out myself, um, my limits and the bike's limits, um, full support from my family um, and, and the charity St Dunstan's who have been behind me all the way and without their support initially, mentally, I, I wouldn't be able to achieve this. And again, the mechanics and the nuts and bolts, the services in general um, have helped me 100% and backed me 100%, in particular the display troop. Ironically, after 20 years of trying to join the Flying Gunners, Billy now rides a trials bike with a display team. Oh, and he averaged 165.85 miles an hour. So whether the crash costs a motocross, a speedway or a trials world title, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.